So hello everyone. As you can see, I am with Bradley P. Beaulieu here uh, for a special video interview. Um, Bradley P. Beaulieu, the writer of the uh, series The Song of the Chattered Sands and uh, The Lays of um, Anuskaya. If, you, we speak, if we, we speak about a fantasy novel, but you also write uh, some science fiction novel as well. Uh, so Mr. Beaulieu, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, I, and uh, bonjour, I'm a uh, lecture Francaise, Francais. Perfect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> your, your French is great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I want to start with a personal, personal and funny question, uh, because um, you told Michaela and you told me before that you have a, a, a passion for names. So I will ask you, I want to ask you about the P. What does the P mean in Bradley P. Beaulieu? Because I search a little everywhere, but <laughs> I just see the P and I would like to know what is the P. Oh yeah, it's, it's uh, Patrick. Patrick. Uh, oh. Yeah, Patrick. Um, it, I was my grandfather on my dad's side. Uh, his nickname was Pat. Pat. And so I, I was named Patrick, so. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah, I just, um, I know we're going to talk later about the science fiction side of things. Um, and I just, I created a pen name for uh, my science fiction stuff. And it's uh, Brendan P. Bellacourt. Uh, I, ke I kept the, the BPB yeah. thing just so I can actually, just so I can sign it the same way. Because uh, I, I do uh, the calligraphy signature. Yeah. And I, I just do like the three letters basically. And <laughs> it, ma it makes it easier. Yeah, it's clever. So I, I would just up. Yeah, I yeah. signed that not too long ago. Yeah, I um I tell people I, I started doing calligraphy uh, because, well, I did it in junior high school, but also my regular signature is terrible. It just looks <laughs> horrible. Um, so the calligraphy thing is is nice. It's just you know it's just three letters, but they look cool and it's something fun to do and it doesn't take me too long, but. It gives me enough time to have a little chat, you know, with somebody while I'm talking to them about, you know, books or whatever. And is it clever because we can identify you um, yeah. so quickly? Yeah, so yeah, you, exactly. So obviously, it's you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's iconic, you know, in a way too. It's like a logo almost, um, and it, it actually matches. If um, uh, on my other books, the uh, Galahesh and the, I guess. maybe not in that one because that was from a different publisher, but the other two have on the binding um, uh, ETV logo that I created a while back too. And so anyway, it all, it all fits together. I think I've got the, the Nightshades books for the- Yeah, you yeah, have the Nightshades, uh, those, yeah, I can't remember those ones might be too. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's a nice little thing to, to do, to have. And I, I enjoy it. I, uh, I found, there's a, a calligraphist Uh, world famous in that in that realm called Seb Lester. Okay, uh, and he's uh, just it's just gorgeous. He has some videos on YouTube that show him doing some really really complex things. But but also there was one that was just a uh, a practice. Um, he was doing a practice book, and and so it was just a small journal, and he was doing just the letters A B C D, so on and so on. Uh, and so I liked the hand, it's called a hand, the type of calligraphy so much that I just I paused on the B and the P and then I just practiced forever until I could do it kind of quickly. Uh, so yeah, that's fun. It is re related maybe with your, um, your passion with design and art, maybe. We can talk about this later, maybe with the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah a bit, yeah. I heard about this. <laughs> so... Um, As I said, you are the white writer of the Song of the Chattered Sand series, uh, six books, uh, one prequel, and uh, five, and um, soon six novellas. Yeah. Um, but we may have uh, maybe some stranger here that doesn't know the Changazi Desert. Can sure. you summarize briefly the, the series? Yeah, so it's, um, I often say that it's, uh, a song of ice and fire meets Arabian nights. Yeah. Um, and so there's, you know, there's, uh, I'm a huge fan of big sweeping epic fantasy. Uh, I'm a Tolkien disciple. Um, I liked um, the wheel of time was, was a favorite 
series for for some time but then uh song of ice and fire uh was it just blew my mind i thought it was great how gritty it was also glenn cook is another influence of mine uh, and he writes kind of grim dark ish fantasy um you know kind of in the trenches instead of you know on high with kings and queens and such uh, but martin has this cool mixture of kings and queens right but then fighting in the trenches and it gets you know very dirty and and desperate um and i, and I like that um but i also like people like guy gabriel k uh, yes. who writes just beautiful lyrical prose too and so i try to straddle that line a little bit you know between gritty and lyricism um and and so uh the song of the shattered sands is a story uh that features cheta um, Cheta is a young woman when we meet her and we find out early on that she lost her mother to the 12 kings of Sharakai, who are um, rulers who have lived for centuries. They are apparently undying. Um, they have ruled with an iron fist and they have made no shortage of enemies along the way. Uh, and so Cheta vows to avenge her mother um, and she really doesn't have a chance to do that, to follow through on that threat until um, years later when she discovers some poems hidden in a book her mother left her. Uh, and those poems, as it turns out, are related to how the kings gained their power um, and perhaps some of their weaknesses as well. Um, and so she, she uses that to her advantage. Um, and in doing so, she stumbles across um, a certain type of people called the Asirum. The Asirum are these sort of twisted kind of kind of zombie ghoul like undying creatures who uh, are beholden to the kings they are part of the reason the kings have ruled as long as they have um, and and coming across them um, is, is sort of a touchstone for her mother's heritage and what her mother was doing in the city in the first place uh, and so th things kind of um, snowball from there. Uh, it, it changes a little bit from a quest of revenge to a story that's a little bit about Cheda's people, where she came from, where her mother came from, and why she came to the city. But also, Sharakai is, is a city that uh, has ruled the desert, which is um, a place that controls trade between four large kingdoms uh, and beyond. Uh, and so it's become very powerful. Uh, it's kind of a center of commerce. It's a, a metropolitan area with a lot of uh, racial uh, influences, uh, cultural influences. Uh, and so those countries have coveted Sharakai for a long time. And so as things start to snowball, they see an opportunity. And, and so now things start to slip towards war potentially so that's that's kind of the, the the early arc you know we might talk about the later arc uh, but that's kind of the entree to the series this is something i liked because uh when i started the first book uh, yeah. it was a um, story about revenge but um uh, it's more than that it's bigger it's bigger yeah 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 and uh, you know i <laughs> I've seen people talk about that a fair bit too in reviews and, and such. And, and just for me personally, I, you know, I think with exceptions, revenge often doesn't last long. We, yeah. It's hard to hold that in your heart, you know, for, uh, forever. Um, and so that, that almost had to change, you know, over time. And so I, I, I did like exploring the things that she discovered because a lot of the stories about um, lost history, lost, lost heritage, lost culture, um, and her rediscovering it, you know, yeah. um, and, and so that becomes a, a desire as well. It's it's not it's not just a tale of revenge. It, it morphs into something different, um, and then searching for ways to bring that back, searching for ways to free those people that she didn't know existed uh, when when the story starts. Um, yeah, so it was it was fun to to go through that um, that change, that evolution in the story. <laughs> that makes me makes me want to read again the first. Book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I haven't, um, I haven't reread the entire series for a while, you know, at this point, um, I, I usually go back and, and read like two, three books, you know, into the, to the one that I'm currently working on. Um, but I did know, uh, you know, where the story was headed quite early on. And so I, I did, I did try to seed things along the way. Uh, I, I, I listened to, I was at a, um, 
a tour uh, in the UK with Brandon Sanderson yeah. uh, for a couple of stops. Uh, he went on to do a lot more than I did, but um, he was talking about how he, he likes to write for um, three different kinds of people. Uh, one is the, say, average science fiction or fantasy fan. Another one is sort of a, a, a fan, of, uh, someone who's familiar with his work. Um, and then the third one is the super fan. So the, the, the people who know like all about the, you know, the worlds and he has that, um, what is it? The Cosmere uh, yeah. is like his larger universe where you know, like all of his, you know, like 30 some, you know, books are, are related to that, uh, that universe, that multiverse actually. Uh, and so, um, so he likes to seed things between stories. Um, and I'm not doing the same thing that he is, but I, I like that. That struck me. And so I do try to put in little things that like maybe on a second read or something like that, or the careful reader, you know, will pick up on and go, Oh, you know, that's, that's why that thing happened in, in the beginning of the, you know, the, the book. And, uh, and I may not touch on it for, uh, another book or two books, you know, where years have passed or something like that, but I, I try to, you know, create this weave, you know, that's, that makes it, I don't know, um, more interesting for those who want to dig in, you know, um, wh while keeping it interesting for those who just, you know, do a single read and enjoy it for that. I like when I read a book to put some, um, uh, you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, glasses, you know, and yeah. Shoes. So yeah. it's exactly this when you 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 pick up the the book for you you're here. Oh no, that's right. Uh, we talk about this in the book two or the book three, and it's yeah. very clever. Very clever. yeah, and even the um, I mean, I know we're going to talk about the novellas, but um, sometimes the sometimes the novellas were a way for me to expand on some of the characters. Yeah. But you know, as I was writing them, there was there was stuff that came up that I was just like, I can't. I can't let this go. I can't, I can't not mention it, um, in the, in the books, you know? So like, um, the demon, uh, the demon, demon veiled, uh, the, I'm forgetting the, the title of my own book at this point. Edward Prince. Edward Prince and the demon veiled. Um, so that one was focused on, a, a Brahma, a tertiary character in the beginning, Brahma. Um, and he became, I really liked him, you know, by the end. And, and so the, a whole bunch of stuff in there. And I didn't know much about this creature, which is like a, a, a dark genie type character called an Arek. Uh, and the Arek are, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they were created by the gods. Um, and they're, they're sort of jealous of humanity because mortals, because mortals were given blood of the first gods. Um, and the Erect were created of the young gods, the second gods, um, essentially the children of the first gods. The first gods have since left the world. Uh, and the creatures that are left behind that remember them, um, uh, they, they pine for those elder days. They, they miss the, the first gods terribly, deeply. Um, and in fact, that becomes part of the entire arc of the whole series. But for the Arek, um, the, one of the reasons that they sort of prey and toy with humanity is because they have something that the Arek will never have, um, which, is, which is the blood of the first gods. But that also means they get to go to the next world. They get to go to the farther fields, uh, the afterlife, you know, in this world. Um, and they're, they're crazy with jealous, uh, jealousy because mortals can do that. And so they kind of mess with them, you know, um, uh, toy with them, torture them. Um, and so, you know, so that became a whole thing uh, in, in that story. And also in the, in the prequel story um, that, that sort of spun new ideas for books like two, three, four, uh, especially uh, uh, room. Ash became a major part of that, um, that sequence. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really fun for me to explore these little corners of um Shara Kai and you know and see what comes of them and, and kind of incorporate that stuff later so um, i have three questions from the from three followers and uh, i will ask them um uh, yet uh, now because we talk about the series we talk about the the the, the prequel the novellas and um, yeah. i have a question from Cyrielle. um she wants to ask you if you have uh, planned all the books the six books uh, since the beginning with all the novellas and uh, the prequel as well. 
Yeah, so um, the, the six book arc, uh, well, first of all, uh, I will say that I had planned it as five books. I, I didn't know it was going to be six, but it, some people think it was only a trilogy that expanded, uh, but that's not true. Uh, we, we sold three books in the beginning uh, yeah. because most publishers just getting into the business side of things, Intriguing. most publishers simply won't buy more than three books. Um, it's, just, it's just too much. They're, they don't know how the series is going to do, and so they don't want to put that much money, you know, into a project until they know that it's going to, to go. Um, so we sold three, but then I planned on five. And then the, the first book, the very first book, I had planned on um, writing an epic fantasy uh, f- focused on a single character, single POV, and that was going to be Cheda. Uh, and in fact, I wrote the entire first book uh, from only her POV. Um, so my first draft was just Cheda, nobody else. Uh, and then as I was going through the second draft, um, I, 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 was, I was starting to go through um, uh, great pains to show other points of view um, because it's a, it's a huge story uh, and it, it felt unnatural. Uh, and so I'm like, well, I, I need to add more. And so you'll see in the, in the first book, it's like half Cheda and then like half other people. And then th- that balance kind of shifts as the stories move along, it, there's more characters that get POVs. Cheda's absolutely my main character throughout, but um, other people need to, to tell their tale too. And there's a, there's a lot to tell. So, um, so that first book became two books because I had to, uh, I had to limit it, you know, to a degree. I had to add more, more, more characters, uh, more POVs to, to tell the tale. Um, so that's why it went from five to, to six. Uh, and then the, um, the novellas, um, I, I, did, I hadn't planned on writing any in the beginning. Um, not that I, you know, didn't want to do any. I just hadn't thought about it really. Yeah. Um, but as as time went on, I was, I was as I was finishing the the like the first book, I think I was like, you know, there's there's a large break in between books, um, and just from a mercenary standpoint. Uh, a marketing standpoint as a, as a author, you know, who's semi-independent. I wanted to keep the shark eye name out there. You know, I wanted people to know about the shattered sands. And so having something come out like roughly halfway between the books uh, felt like a good idea to me. And, and it's a huge, you know, world. And I liked it (laughs) um, a lot, you know, so there was a, a whole bunch of things to explore. And so it was kind of a natural fit just to, to start adding a little bit, um, in between. And so I'm really glad I, I did those because the, um, yeah, I, you know, I like writing short stories, but I, I tend, um, I, I admire people, uh, authors that can write a really good succinct story in about 5,000 words. Uh, that's not me. Uh, I, I tend to write like novel pacing, even in a, in a short story. And I, it, they feel, uh, not that I don't enjoy other people's work, but for me, as I'm writing them, I, I feel like I can't explore enough um, in a short story in 5,000 words. You, you can hardly get anywhere or, or get into any kind of complexity. Um, so they end up being novella size for me almost always. Um, it's just my natural length that way. So yeah, it was a really fun way to, to sort of dig into some of, some of the past. Um, most of them, almost all of them, and there was one exception, um, were sold uh, as a short story to some like a magazine or an anthology. And then I got the rights back and I published them myself, you know, whatever, six months or a year later. Um, The one exception is the third novella in um, uh, of sand and malice made uh, is the, the prequel. It's, it's kind of a, it's novel length, but it's three novellas that are kind of a, a knockout to, oh, yeah. to tell like one arc. Um, so that that third story I wrote only for that, just so I could give readers something new, you know, who had read the other two. Um, yeah. So that the novellas were something that, that um, uh, I, I, I really enjoyed and, and helped, you know, to sort of market the series at the same time. But, you know, uh, as a, as a reader, uh, I was totally devastated after the book four. Yeah. <laughs> And this one was perfect uh, in between, you know, the, the two books. That oh, was- yeah. Yeah, that one, um, I, I, uh, I can't remember if we talked about this or not, but the um, for, kind of from early on, well, let's say 
after the third book, I was starting to think about, am I going to continue to write this after the, you know, the sixth book? So, so I, you know, I started to give some thought to what a, what a new trilogy or something like that could be after the series was done. Uh, and so I always kind of liked Mala, uh, who was one of the main characters in the one you just showed, The Flight of the Whisper King. One, yeah. Um, so that's Mala, the little girl on the my lower left. Um, and the, the sure. woman standing up is Shora. Sure. Um, and so she's the she's a kestrel, like one of the, the very elite swords, uh, swords women uh, of the uh, of the city of Sharkai. Uh, and so anyway, so Ma- I'm thinking Mala, um, giving away a little bit of spoilers here. Mala will be one of the main characters in this new future someday mm-hmm. trilogy. Um, and the other main character will be Ransana, who is Isan's daughter. Um, she's a baby at the end of the, the series and stuff. So we meet her. Uh, but we don't know what she's like yet because she's just a baby. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to that. But I have I have a bunch of other projects I have to finish before I can think about it. We will talk about your next project, of course. But uh, yeah. I have another question from Amandine, this one. Um, she has, I want to ask you if you could rewrite, re- oh, sorry, rewrite uh, a volume of one of your saga. Which one would it be and why? Mm-hmm. rewrite well um I want to yeah I, you know i'd have to i mean I, mo- most authors me included uh once we've written something you know we we realize it becomes canon you know it you, you can't you can't go back and so you don't even really think about that type of thing um but um if if i could you know like one of the things i really enjoy is to foreshadow um but to foreshadow in very subtle ways Okay. Um, but in ways that are, you know, that, that the readers pick up on, you know, so like knowing what I know now, I, I know some details um, that I, you know, I knew where the story was headed, but I didn't know the exact incarnation of the ending of this, of the whole series. Obviously I do now. Um, and so if I could, maybe the very first book, uh, 12 Kings, I would go back and just like kind of put little things um, about, you know, what's coming so that the arc feels like balanced, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like like one, one of the great feelings uh, of reading a, a, a great story is when you get to the end, you feel like everything resonates, you know, like everything from the beginning to the end makes this story whole, makes it feel greater than the sum of its parts, right? Um, <laughs> because it was all of this. Yeah, you know, and, and of course that, that was my goal. And I, you know, I think I hit a lot of the notes you know that i was that i was shooting for um but even so like Um, but even so like i say there's like i i didn't know who ashael was i didn't even have a name for ashael at that point um i didn't know how the conflict with the young gods was going to play out exactly i knew what they wanted um but i didn't know how how things were going to end you know so so now you know now that i know like what ashael looks like how he acts what what the other gods did to him um i i would go and like sprinkle you know little little things you know about him um mm-hmm. along the way yeah. perfect yeah it would be uh, maybe nice you know to to find some uh, architectural um, uh, design of maybe a, a sculpture of the elder gods and maybe a child in the first or the, the second book, you know, some, of yeah. the, some little clue like this. And yeah, and then, you know, and even, even though I, I say that, like I, I always try, I teach writing a, a fair bit. Yeah. And one of my talks that I give is one on what I call connective tissue. Um, and connective tissue is, is just this notion of having different elements be connected in some way. And so that could be like two characters who are completely independent of one another initially, but later you say, oh, well, maybe they're cousins. Okay, so, so maybe they have a family history. Or it could be like um, some event happens uh, midway through a book and you can decide, oh, well, this happened because this small, this minor character or the main character did something small that snowballed you know, and so so it, it makes it feel like the story that like there's a 
a, a, a net, like a mesh, you know, and it makes things feel tighter uh, along the way. And so like when I, when I started to think of Ashael and how, you know, where is he? He's, he's a God. He's a first God. He is the only first God that remains in, in the desert. Uh, and there are hints. I placed hints along the way that not all of the elder gods left the world when the, the great departure happened an eon ago. Um, and so I remember, I think that was in the first book that I put that one. Uh, and then, so anyway, so I was trying to figure out where he would come from and then uh, where, where they would find him. And then in Of Sand and Malice Made, completely separate from this, I, I did not have this planned. Uh, the characters went to this pit uh, so that a sort of a soothsayer, Odzin, um, yeah. could summon these weird little creatures, these Ifin, um, who are creatures that can kind of follow fate. Um, and so um, he summons them up and, and Cheda and Brahma use that Ifin. Um, and then those things show up again in like book four, maybe, I think book four. Um, and then uh, maybe three. Uh, so, you know, so I wanted to use that pit again. Uh, so I gave, I gave it a name, the hollow uh, by the, the sixth book. And, um, and, and it just helps everything feel like I had it all planned from the beginning, you know, when I really did. <laughs> the great masterpiece. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, it, it just, it just a- adding those connections just makes the story feel, you know, deeper, more whole. It gives me satisfaction, you know, mm-hmm. and hopefully, you know, the reader as well. Um, you talk about the, the Eric and the Asylum, mm-hmm. and I have a question from Samela. Uh, about the Asylum. She found them uh, very disturbing at first and their life very tragic. Uh, she wants to know your inspiration to create them. You talk about zombies. or uh, For me, uh, there, was, uh, there were like a, um, some mummy, you know, the, the, from the, the movie, the, the, yep. the, the mummy, yeah? yeah? It was like something like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, you know, that type of thing. I mean, I, I'm a long time Dungeons and Dragons player. Um, and th- there's um, uh, zombies and, and offshoots of zombies, you know, have showed up again and again, you know, over the years. And, and there was even some um, in the Deities and Demigods uh, book. It was a manual for Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and it, and it, um, it came out in the 80s sometime. Um, and it, what it did was it was, it, it was trying to, to codify the all the different gods from different pantheons so the 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 greek gods the roman gods the uh, mexican south american gods um on and on um and they, i think they had an egyptian one as well and so there was like different um different gods uh there was like an undead one or the uh, one that brought you to the land of the dead i, I forget exactly um you know so i I associate that with the desert to a degree, you know, mummies in general, but ghouls as well, you know, some kind of undying thing. Uh, but I really um, detest is a strong word, but it borders on that. I hate it when there are, say, monsters in, in books or, or stories and they're, and they're just evil. There's nothing interesting about them. Um, all they're there for is to I don't know, you know, uh, kill and slay and, and to produce kind of this, this cheap effect, you know, on the reader, you know, a, a scare factor. Um, and, and so I wanted them to be, you know, much more interesting to that. You know, I, I couldn't let that go um, at just that. Uh, that being said, one of my earliest visions of Sharkai in the story, this was very early on before I even knew much about Cheda or the Kings or anything, one of the very first visions I had was of like this creature, you know, stealing into this desert city and taking people and dragging them out into the desert. Um, I had no idea what they were. I didn't know what they were called. I didn't know why they were taking people. Um, and so um, as time went on, I, you know, I, I, I knew I wanted this, you know, strong female protagonist. I knew I had the Kings, you know, I knew she would rise to sort of challenge them in some way. And I had these creatures. Um, and so as, you know, as time went on, there became a, a little bit of a, a feedback cycle. Um, uh, I knew that Cheda's mother had come to the city uh, uh, for, for something, for a mission, uh, and that she didn't tell Cheda. So Cheda was young when her mother died and her mother felt she wasn't ready um, or, or that she would 
tell other people and put them both at risk, um, what she was doing. Um, but, but eventually it became kind of clear that Jada's mother was after the Kings uh, because of what they had done to her people, Jada's people, uh, her mother's people. Uh, and um, those people are related to the Asirum. Uh, and the kings gained their power from the desert gods um, uh, when the city was being threatened. They, they begged and pleaded for the gods to save them. And one of the things the gods gave them was the Asirum, these, these creatures. Uh, and so now there are, there are th these three pillars of the story are connected. You know, Shade is connected to the kings. The kings gained power uh, by gaining the Asirum and their own personal powers. And the Asirum are related to Cheetah's people. And so that, that triangle became the basis of the entire story. Uh, and again, it wasn't clear in the beginning, but you know, as time went on, that, that became something I went back to constantly um, to flesh out you know, what was happening in the story. Um, and it also, again, I had no idea what was, this was going to happen in the beginning, but the, the kings, uh, desperate, went to the desert gods 400 years ago, um, pleaded for help, um, and the gods gave it to them. And then the question was, why? Why would the gods do this? Uh, and so it, it started to become clear the gods had a purpose too. And, and so, you know, as the stories move along, you start to get the sense that the gods have some ulterior motive um, and that their plans, whatever they are, are getting closer. Um, and it gets more and more dangerous as things move along. So it's, it's no longer just about the safety of Shar Kai and its people and the kingdoms that surround it. Um, it's, it's about saving the desert itself from the God's plan. Um, and so it was, it was just, it was great, you know, for me to, it's super fulfilling to, as, as a writer to like find some of those basic, you know, keys, those, those central components of a story and, and, um, and to use it and then, you know, kind of follow through once you have those ideas. And it works because we are, for me, we have the book one and two. Uh, this is Sharakai, and the book three and four. And we will see more and more of the of the empire uh, all around Sharakai. And the book five and six, uh, we dive into the mythologic way, you know, with the other gods and uh, and the, the new gods as well. So the rhythm is very very good, uh, and you can we can see all the the picture. The great picture. Yeah, yeah. I uh, early on when, when I, I think I had started the first book by this point, uh, I attended a, um, a convention, Gen Con, in Indianapolis, uh, and one of my favorite authors and a friend, Scott Lynch, uh, was there. So, The Lies of Locke Lamora, one of my favorite books of all time, and that series is just I have stupendous. To. I love it. Um, and so he was talking about. Um, some people that he admired, uh, and I'm, I'm going to forget, I always forget one of the names, but um, Lois McMaster Bujold uh, was one that he mentioned. Well, um, and, yeah, uh, and so I, I have not yet read her, but she, he mentioned that she, um, that her, I think her, her long running series, she likes to take a story and they're, they're kind of independent of each other. Okay. So each story has its, its, its own thing. Um, and, and is related to others, but not in the way you think it, you know, not, not like a Lord of the Rings trilogy where it's really just one big story cut up into pieces. Yeah. Uh, and so Scott did, he admitted, you know, the same thing with uh, Locke, uh, Lamora, his main character and, and the gentleman, gentleman bastards. Um, and so like the, the first, first book, the lives of Locke Lamora is like a Ocean's 11 heist type story. And then the second one, uh, Red Skies Over Red Seas, is, is like a uh, piracy, uh, you know, on, on the high seas uh, type, type tale. Uh, and then the third one gets into politics. The fourth one will get into espionage, the war. Yeah. Uh, and I forget what the, the, like the, the last one is. I think, it's, I think it's five books he's planning, or maybe six. Um, and so, yeah, so each one has its own flavor. And so in the Shark High series, I'm like, okay, well, I love that idea. <clears throat> you know, the first one I'm going to show... Shar Kai from down low, yeah. uh, on low. So, you know, we see the streets, we see where Cheda grew up, we see yes. the moonless host who are trying to tear down the kings, you know, and so it's, it's a very gritty part of Shar Kai. Uh, and then in the second book, um, Cheda 
I won't give why, but she gets a bird's eye view of what the life is like inside of the House of Kings, which is where the kings all live and the, the blade maidens who protect them, the daughters of the kings um, live as well. Uh, and and so, so it's kind of the flip, you know, the, the reverse uh, of that. So we get to see kind of how the inner workings of the kings. And then the third book, um, she goes out to the desert. You know, it's largely outside of Sharkai. And so we, we start to see the influence of the desert tribes yeah. on Sharkai, on the Moonless Host, on Sheeta herself and Emery, her best friend. Um, uh, and then fourth book, you know, all throughout the, the first half, um, she's kind of, she's a, a little bit on her heels. She has not yet come into her own power, you know, so to speak. And so book four is really about her. She has reached that point. It is, it is time for her to lead and she does so, you know, and, and that carries through the, the rest of the books. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I, I wanted to sort of take a, a mosaic approach a, yeah. a bit, you know, to the shark high in the desert. Um, so people could see different parts of it. Um, I'll mention another great influence on this whole series uh, and that is uh, the Thieves' World shared world anthology uh, from like the 1890s. It's, it's got 20 or so some books, um, and I haven't read them all. I've read like the first seven or eight or something, um, and I oh, just adored those, um, mainly because they showed like a, they showed a city um, called Sanctuary, uh, yeah. which is at the southern end of this large but crumbling empire. And so there's another empire that's sweeping in from the south, and there's there's war. It, it sweeps over sanctuary, and so the people that are in it have to kind of fend for themselves in in some ways. You know, they they know that things are changing, and they they can't do much about it. They're just trying to to make make do. Um, and so, the, you know, because it's a shared world anthology, a bunch of different authors wrote you know different stories with different characters, and so you get a very different sort of feel from each. Uh, each character, but they're all in, set in sanctuary. Yeah, um, and so you get you get this just really cool um, view of sanctuary. You 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 get these these piecemeal view of what the city is like and such. And I, I wanted to try to reproduce that to a degree. You know, it's it's obviously one story with you know just a, a handful of of characters. But when I tell other POVs, I do try to take that sort of approach, like have, you know, they have, they're their own person. They have a different mindset. They have a different history. They have their own view of what Sharkai is and is not, you know? And, and so I, I try to use that to show Sharkai in the desert at large. You, that's great because you, you speak about uh, characters. So uh, I have another question of course. So um, who are your favorite one? And If you ate one of your characters in secret, <laughs> which <laughs> one? <laughs> so favorite characters? Yeah. And then which ones I hate? Um, uh, you know, I, I gravitate to Shada because she's, she's my main character. Yeah, but she is, uh, she is complex, but she is a fairly typical heroine. You know, she, I mean, she, she's strong. She is uh, very loyal um, to her friends, sometimes to a fault. You know, she sometimes lets that blind her. Um, But it's, if, you, if you listen to like actors talk about the roles that they play, um, they very often say that the most, most fun to play are the villains. Um, and for me, King Hassan, you know, I, he, I mean, he's, he's, such a, he's such an interesting character. He's one of the kings. He is called, for, for those who haven't read it, he's called the honey-tongued king uh, for good reason. Um, he, uh, he has a power that the gods gave him to command. So he can tell people what to do and they will follow that command, whatever it is. Uh, but in fact, he doesn't like using it. He kind of likes using his own wile, you know, his, his guile and his wit um, to get people to do what he wants them to do. And he's good at it, you know, and, and, he's, and he's sarcastic, you know, and he, um, he's, uh, he's fun to write, you know, because I, I get to step out of that sort of heroic role and, and make him kind of a, a dick, you know, sometimes uh, yes. to people. Um, you know, he's very... Uh, you know, haughty uh, in the beginning, you know, uh, very proud of himself. And um, he has, you know, great sweeping plans for the city, for himself um, and for his, his queen, Nyan. Um, so, you know, so he's, he's probably, you know, those, those two are my main ones. Uh, Miriam as well became like a, a super big favorite uh, for me to write. 
Um, she started out as just a, I didn't I didn't think much of her in the beginning, um, but but as time went on, um, you know, it became clear just how driven she was. I mean, she was like singularly focused on gaining revenge for the death of her sister. Um, and the, the, the main character who introduced her was Ramad. Uh, Ramad is like kind of one of the three main heroes of the book, uh, along with Cheda and Emery. Uh, and so, so he, she came with Ramad to the desert to try to avenge the death of her sister, Ramad's wife, uh, and her daughter. Um, uh, they both died at the hands of a man named Masid, who was part of the Moonless Host, uh, who was trying to make a statement. He was trying to show that the desert is theirs, and that the king's rule must stop. Um, and so Ramad and, and Miriam are out to, to get them. And so they kind of played the part of the wild card early on. Um, you know, there's all this stuff going on between the kings uh, and the moonless host and Cheda is kind of caught in the middle. Um, but I needed somebody to act as like a placeholder for the other kingdoms. And in the beginning, that was Ramad. And so, you know, so, so Miriam is just like pushing, 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 you know, Ramad <laughs> is like, uh, he's like willing to, to make peace at a certain point, you know, and Miriam is like, no, <laughs> we will not make peace with these people. We are going to gain our revenge. And that's just like snowballs over time. She becomes, it becomes worse and worse and worse in her mind. Like she cannot get enough of it. Um, and so she's, she's cracked. You know, she she loses her, her sanity in essence, you know, along the way. And it's not quite that way in the beginning, but it becomes that way for sure. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it's kind of fun to write that kind of person, too. Like, you, you know, Isan is a, is, is a villain-ish, um, but, he, but he's smart and he, he knows that he can't take things too far. And he does see the light as time goes on. And Miriam does not, absolutely does not. And so they're, they're almost like part of a spectrum, you know, Cheda, good, Athan in the middle, you know, kind of chaotic, good character, maybe. And then um, Miriam is like lawful evil uh, in the end. Dragon history, <laughs> the character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then um, the, uh, the, the one that I secretly hate? Yeah. Was that the, the question? Um, man, you know, I mean, so many of the characters, when, when you write a character, you're like, you're trying to make them so not, not that they're lovable, but that you find them interesting in, in some way. I mean, you know, Marion does some terrible, terrible things. Um, you know, so her partially, but I, I'd probably say the one person is Hamid. Uh, Hamid is uh, Emery's, one of Emery's friends um, from childhood, also Cheda's. They grew up together along with Brahma, along with Davood, along with Tariq. Uh, so there was like this cluster of, of gutter wrens, they're called, these kids that run the streets and stuff. And so they grew up learning the city together. Um, and Hamid became wholly invested in the moonless hosts who were trying to bring down the kings. Um, and he hates that like other people, including Masid, um, uh, start, start to, you know, uh, uh, not give up their goals, uh, but they see the reality of things and they realize they cannot use violence forever. You know, at some point they do have to make peace and try to grow, you know, the, their people and find safety for their people. Um, and ha Hamid, a little bit like Miriam, um, although he's, he's just snottier about it, um, it re refuses to let that happen. He, he, wants to, he wants the Moonless Host to be what it was. He wants to destroy Sharkai. He wants the desert tribes to continue their tradition of just wandering the, the uh, desert, like Bedouin tribes, uh, and um, yeah, and, and control the desert, get all the interlopers out. Um, he's, a, he's a xenophobe. Um, he does not want any other kingdoms in the desert besides the tribes. Um, and so, you know, he is a, he's a hardliner, um, uh, and, and I, I hate that kind of person. And so I, I do hate him. He's probably my <laughs> one, yeah, the one that way I would like, yeah. You want zero, oh. no, zero compromise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, I, I love to hate Miriam. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's like the, the wicked witch of the... the, the oh, yeah. 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 When I was a child, I was scared about, about the, the wicked witch. Yeah. Uh, I was so scared about, about Miriam uh, from, from book four. I was, oh my God, 
oh no, oh no. <laughs> Until the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was it was it was fun seeing her like kind of progress. I mean, you know, Hamid is a little bit different in that, you know, they're, they're similar characters, but Hamid doesn't have the power that yeah. Miriam has. Miriam has you know, untold amounts of power by the end of the, the story. And then, you know, she loses some along the way, but gains a different sort of power in, by the sixth book, you know? And so, you know, then it's like, she has it again. And what is she going to do with it? You know, she'll stop at nothing, you know, by this point. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was fun seeing her progress, you know, in, in her evilness. Um, you, you, you speak about the, 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 the last book. So, Uh, the release was the 13th of July. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so I read it, of course. Uh, I also um, listen it with Kate Reading. Uh, yeah. The way she's so great for the series. She's yeah. very great. Um, she was not something that I, I expected. Uh, I thought you will create something like the book four. So for me, the book four is... Um, super epic, super breathtaking, and uh, I think this one is better than I know, that the first thing I expected because it, it was something emotional from the start till the end. Yeah, it was very nostalgic too because you um, you make some uh, some point, you know, you you um, uh, some link with all the books and all the. The novelas, uh, this one, uh, yep. for example, she's my favorite one. Yeah. And, uh, it was so good. Uh, I think I never read something like this uh, for a final series. Maybe the, um, the Return of the King from Tolkien. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to uh, spoil that. So you will, you will see if you uh, read this book, you will see. But Uh, it was so emotional. I cried a lot, like also <laughs> in your book. <laughs> um, how was it to, to read this book for you? As yeah. It was the, the last one. I mean, it, I mean it, was, it was emotional too. It, you know, writing a, a book, any of these take six to nine months to draft initially, and then many more months, you know, to... Um, along with other projects, you know, to, to, uh, to edit, you know, and revise and, and to make it, make it clean and stuff. So I'll, I'll say two things to, you know, one was that I was, I was at the, I had everything set up by the end of book five. Uh, I had meant book five to be like an, Oh shit moment. You know, like, like everything is now clear. We know, you know, Okay, so years ago, I'm going to step back a little bit. Um, I, went, I went to some writing um, classes, some seminars by Kij Johnson, uh, a brilliant short story writer and novelist. And she was talking about like um, writers, don't, you know, if you have the cards, play them. Uh, don't, don't hold them forever, you know, and you can sometimes play things too early. Um, but, you know, What I had initially planned to do was to, to wait for the big reveal that shows up in book five for book six. Um, and, and so, and, but I, as I started to think about it more, I'm like, no, I, you know, I think I really do want to, to show that. I want that to be the ending of book five so that we, we get a sense of the danger that the, the desert is in. Um, and, and it also kind of sets everything up. And so that put everything, all the boulders on the top of the hill Um, and everything was ready to roll down by that point. Um, and so as I got to the actual book, it was, it was an easy write uh, because I, I knew, uh, and this is true of the end of any book or series for me, because I, you know, I've spent so much time trying to figure out how it begins, how things complicate throughout the story. And then I narrow in, you know, towards the end. And so there's really not much left to do, but write it, you know, at that point, there aren't decisions to be made anymore. Uh, for the most part. Um, and so that was true of the sixth book. I, I just, I knew where it was headed. Uh, but, um, you know, at the same time, like one of the things like pretty early on, uh, I knew I wanted to do was to, to sort of harken back to a whole bunch of things from the, the rest of the series, uh, especially, I didn't have this in mind 
before I started writing book six, but once it came to me, I absolutely wanted to, to, uh, to dig into it more. Cheetah's mother. Um, Cheetah, Cheetah has a, an experience, um, uh, visions. Uh, let's, let's leave it at that for now. Um, that lets me show a little bit more of her mother. And I haven't done that for like four books at this point. You know, the first two books had flashbacks. Yep. Um, I dropped the flashbacks after book two. And so there's, there's little bits and pieces that we see of Aya, uh, her mother, uh, little reminders of her, but I, I wanted some like, like a direct connection to her mother because her mother started this story. Um, so did other people, you know, but for Cheda, um, it was her mother and her mission. That's, that's why Cheda was uh, born <laughs> um, uh, in part. Uh, and, and, you know, so her mother, her, her mother's mission became her own. Um, and so I, I just, I wanted to, to have a connection there. And so that, that felt really uh, emotional, uh, freeing, um, you know, in a way, a kind of cathartic, you know, for me as a writer to, to touch on some of the things that I had hinted at for so long um, and to give Cheda a sense of closure, you know, uh, as the story was, was closing. You know, so that's like one main example, but... Um, the perfect conclusion, because for me, uh, so it is more, more than just a, a revenge story. It is yeah. about family. Yeah, yeah. Something, if we, um, if we um, follow you on uh, Facebook or Instagram, uh, we can see that family is important for you. And that's something we can uh, find in, in your books. Yeah. The first one. And to um, reconnect this uh, with Aya it was so perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if, I mean, for me too, I, I felt that as I was writing it, it felt really good uh, to show some of those, those connections between them uh, from the past and present. Um, uh, Lior, uh, Cheda's great-grandmother, Leora, uh, and her sister, Devora, who are the main characters in... Um, the Doors at Dusk and Dawn. Um, so the, that was a really fun story to write. That's one of my favorites. Um, yeah. So that's like 60 or 70 years before the main you know, story uh, shows up. But I, I liked her so much uh, from writing her early on. I wanted to expand on her. So I did in that, uh, in that novella. You know, but I wanted, I wanted something for them, her as well and her sister. Um, other characters, I mean, you know, Brahma yeah. um, appears in a way, um, you know, so just, you know, just trying to, you know, I, I mentioned foreshadowing, which I tried to do a lot of, but it's just as important for me to like hearken back to the past as you're getting towards the end of the story. So it's, it's, it's not just enough to sort of tell the reader kind of what's coming to, you know, to, to give them some satisfaction when it comes, but also to take little moments to, to sort of reflect you know, on, on the journey that has been made. Um, I, I often, and when I talk about writing, I talk about Sam and Frodo in the Lord of the Rings when they're going towards Mount Doom to throw the ring in. Tolkien takes time several times um, to have them think about life in the Shire. Uh, and, you know, they, they pine for their days sitting and smoking pipe weed and having parties and beer and, you know, um, that sort of thing, having big birthday celebrations, you know, whatever. Um, and it, it's essential um, to the charm of that story because yeah. it cannot just be about war um, and conflict and the threat, you know, of Sauron. Uh, it, must, it must also be about uh, what they're fighting for. Uh, and so by Tolkien sort of taking little time here and there, you know, even all the way through the end of their journey, they, they do that again, and, and he does that again and again. And, and it reminds you what they're fighting for, and, and it provides lightness to the darkness. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I try to keep that in mind as well. Like, I, I do want to um, have the characters reflect and think about why they're doing these things, you know, and that sort of thing. And that, that helps me create, you know, a sense of, I don't know, wholeness to the story, that the story is bigger than just the events that are going on you know, inside of the pages. I want it, I want the story to live beyond the pages. So, yeah. Um, so I have another question. Um, and uh, so you have two illustrators from the US cover. 
Adam Paquet and uh, Mika Epstein. And yeah. in France, we have the marvelous uh, uh, Marc Senesi. Mark Senesi, right? Uh, um, <laughs> I lose my mind. Uh, uh, what do you think about the French cover? Uh, I, I mean, I've been a huge admirer of Mark's work for a long time now. And so when Barcelona oh, contracted him, um, you know, for the books, uh, I was I was thrilled. Um, and I can't remember if I think the, the first time I learned that was when I got the cover of the first book. Okay. I, I don't think I'm pretty sure they didn't tell me ahead of time. They just sent me the cover and said, oh, here it is. You know, what do you think? And it was it was at the sketch stage at that point, you know, so we could make some adjustments and such. Um, and the the Twelve Kings cover um, in uh, in France was of this this top down view sort of of the the city, um, this this cool cityscape with with who we assume is you know Cheda on the edge of this you know roof, uh, very Arab you know esque, um, yeah, so similar similar ish, just sure. sort of a different take on it. Um, and I, so I liked that one. Um, I think, I think it's quite good. The second one though, the one you just showed the, the, uh, the, the sign du le sable, yeah. uh, oh, it's gorgeous, man. I just, I, I was blown away when I, when I got the second one, you know, when we came to that, you know, this, uh, one, this one makes always a sensation. Yeah. All the readers. Yeah. Oh my God. I <laughs> for the cover. Yeah. You, you, yeah. <laughs> the story as well <laughs> it's it's i mean i like it's uh, a it's it's just eye-catching it's just gorgeous the colors i love, I love the monochrome effect um but also it, it kind of like it gives an even better sense of what the story is like because it shows the sand and it shows a sand ship yeah. um which kind of shows like adventure um you know on the, on the high seas the high sands you yeah. know so to speak it is a uh, so uh we can relate it that with the uh the, you know the Sherazad and story uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah arabic count um, um uh, myth and legend mm -hmm. yeah 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 for me too and the, actually the so that i like that one and then the third one too um was was kind of a play on the on the american cover the veil of spears which i can see in the upper right there um so that it was it was an influence i know but um And I, I love them both, but Marx just having those like the Asirum kind of flowing around Cheda. Oh, it's just crazy cool. Yeah, I love that one. On the US, she has um, the bracelet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, it's uh, Donato Giancola uh, did the Veil of Spears for the American uh, one. And we did talk about that. Like, um, he didn't have the stone on there initially. Uh, the onyx stone or jet stone, I forget which, <clears throat> Mesut's stone. Uh, and he added, you know, that little bit, you know, to it after the fact. Um, but, you know, his is, is great too. I, you know, I've been super fortunate uh, over the course of this series to, to get, and, and then Micah, um, yeah. the last, the last three covers uh, were by him and they're, ah, they're just so cool because they're, they focus on Cheda um, and more so than any other cover uh in in the series from my different you know versions and such um and the, the uk versions do focus on cheda quite a bit but they're often quite distant and you, you don't you don't get a, a good sense of what she looks like uh and micah is so good at, at like, figures and faces yeah and he has such dynamic you know poses you know for them and such and in this last one that you just showed um she is we talked about this a while um, but he just he captured her intent so well I mean, she is fully in command of, of who she is and what she's trying to do. And Micah put that on the cover. And, you know, so for that reason, I, that's probably my favorite cover at this point of, of all of them. Uh, but they're all great. I love them. You saw Michaela last time and uh, she, she's got the, the U.S. and the U.K. She likes to do Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some cool um, U.K. ones, too, the... Um, The cover, the UK cover for Of Sand and Malice Made was really great. It showed like a sort of a, a behind view of Cheda and, and in this pillar type thing. And she had like a, uh, a helmet in her hand, um, like, a, like I think like a wolf uh, dog type helmet. Uh, that one turned out really cool. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, an embarrassment of, of riches is, is what it is. 
Um, so I, I want to ask you about something we have all live, lived and we live uh, now uh, too. It is the pandemic situation. Um, uh, you, uh, we all have the, uh, sorry. <laughs> we have all been touched by the events. Uh, yeah. For you as a writer, uh, how, do you, how do you leave it uh, with the, the lockdown? With um, you, you can't go to your readers. Uh, you can go to the salon or festival. Yeah, it's it's so writing. Just generally speaking, is like a really lonely profession. Yeah, you know, it's uh, you know, you can do social networking and and interact uh, that way. Uh, but one one of the the major thrills for a writer not every writer some some people are a, a little bit shy and they don't enjoy going to like festivals and salon uh, but I do I, I really like that um, and so I, I just haven't you know I haven't been to anything like that in two years you know at this point um, and so um, yeah I, I miss that stuff I, I really enjoy going to you know uh, it's actually somewhat difficult in the U.S. because it's so large Um, and it's, it isn't quite the same culture here, um, as it is in, in Europe, um, especially in France, from my experience, um, uh, where with Salon and, and the different festivals there, I mean, there's, people are a little bit closer. Um, it's it maybe a bit easier to get to it, but also it, can, it becomes a focus. Uh, so like Les Imaginales, yeah. uh, and, and other ones there, they, they become like sort of a regional thing. Um, and just, they're very populated. Um, you get to talk to a lot of people, everybody's excited. Um, and not to say that there aren't people who go to conventions and aren't excited by books. It's just, it's a different experience in Europe um, uh, from, you know, from my own experience. And, and so I liked, you know, I, I would go to the UK for different festivals there from my publisher, Galance. Uh, they had Galance Fest. Um, so I would try to to go, you know, there each year, anything that I could do in France, I would, you know, try to do, um, and, and even try to like promote myself to ask my publicist if I can, you know, if I can go to this thing or that thing or contact the, the festivals directly. Sometimes I did that a few times and, and got to go to, um, uh, Trolls et Legendes, uh, in Belgium. Um, uh, that was great. Um, Uh, you know, yeah. So you're know, just trying to, to put myself out there and I just can't, I haven't been able to you know, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, and so it's, you know, the pandemic has been difficult enough. Um, you know, and, and so I'm not, I'm not trying to, to cry about this, but you know, at the same time, it's like, I, I miss it. I miss going to these, you know, these things and talking to people. And it's, and it's not just like talking about, you know, my books. I, it's, it's that I get to, I get to meet the publisher Uh, I get to talk a little bit about, you know, future plans, see how things have been going. Also talk to, you know, people who might be fans of the work or, or potential fans of my work. But we get, you know, when I talk to people, we're always talking about fiction, you know, science fiction and fantasy stuff we love. We get to talk about, you know, cool books that we've read. And, and I just don't get a chance to do that very often, you know. So, I, yeah, I miss it a lot. Um, Has the social no. media um, helped you a little? Does what? The, the social media, like uh, Instagram, because um, you are well known to be um, very close to your readers uh, in France. Yeah. And we appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I, it does, um, certainly. Um, and, and in fact, things like this um, help me as well, because I'm, I mean, social media is fun and I, I do enjoy it, um, but it's, it's often like little bite sides, you know. <laughs> things you know it's it's difficult just because it takes a while to type it it's hard to get into depth yeah uh, whereas you know like an interview or something like that it's 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 more fun because i can you know we can chat a little bit we can again talk about you know stuff that we both like science fiction and fantasy and i can maybe pull the covers back a little bit on the on the series which i don't get to do very often you know so that's fun as well um you know, talking about future plans, you know, all that kind of stuff is, is enjoyable. So that, that helps me a lot too. Yeah. I want to talk about the novelas, but first uh, I want to point out 
the, the fact that you uh, offered the novellas, some novellas, uh, during the first lock one, lockdown, oh, sorry. Uh, so I, I would like to thank you again because I started your novella um, on uh, on ebook like, like this. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Perfect. I was uh, I was at home like everybody. And, uh, oh sure, yeah. yeah. Keep me uh, entertained. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. So uh, I wanted to speak about the novellas, and in France, uh, I think that. Uh, the French reader are not very, uh, you know, uh, novelas type, uh, you know. Okay. But uh, how does it work in um, in US? You you talk about uh, with Michaela about um, uh, Brian McClellan, and he's uh, another author with a lot of novelas. Yeah. Uh, is the, um, in a, in the US maybe the the market for the novelas is. Is better. I I don't have a good frame of reference, so I don't know, you know, if it's if it's better than France or not. I will say that I I talked to my publisher Rajalone years ago uh, about trying to publish uh, a Sand and Malice Made when we were we were making deals with uh, the UK publisher and my US publisher for that book, uh, and so we offered it to them, um, and it's it's a bit of a challenge. Because it's not just that the publisher has to pay for my advance and the cover uh, for it; they have to pay for the translation, uh, which is a, just another large cost, you know, to upfront that they have to to pay for. And then add to that that shorter works don't tend to sell as you know nearly as well as like novel length works, um, and it, it just it just added up to them taking a pass. Um, Sorry, I don't know if you can hear that. I'm going to kill this. That's all right. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so, um, so you know, that added up to them passing for the time being. I don't know if they'll eventually pick it up. You know, maybe after this latest book, maybe it could be a, like a collection or something. Uh, we'll see. Um, but in the, in the U.S., and, you know, in the UK, it's, I mean, it's a huge market, you know, the English speaking market. And, and I figure if I'm putting these out myself, um, you know, it's, it's a way to you know, capitalize on, you know, a, a popular series, um, you know, and I can put it out and it can be picked up in the UK, in the US, worldwide uh, by English readers. Uh, and, um, and, and again, like help to... Um, it's partly a marketing tool. It's, it's not just that I want to tell a story. It's a way to keep the, the series alive, yeah. you know, um, and, you know, and to sort of reward uh, fans of the, the series as well. So I can, you know, have some little story that just doesn't fit into the, the, the novels, you know, as a whole, um, but that helps me illuminate you know, the, the, the world of Shark High and the desert and, um, and that sort of thing. So, you know, it serves a bunch of purposes, really. And, and um, it, it just makes sense for me as an author to, to do them. I love, I love novelas. So for me, it's, a, it's like a secret door open to uh, the universe. Yeah. yeah, that's perfect. And it's like a reward for the, the readers. Like, like yeah. yeah, yeah. So we need nearing from the end. Um, uh, you uh, you talk about um, a future project, or maybe it, it's uh, it's this one actually. Uh, last year on your website, the Precipice trilogy. Yes, uh, yeah, the Precipice trilogy is um, is sold. Yeah. Um, it's uh, uh, to my U.S. publisher and my new U.K. publisher, Head of Zeus. Uh, they're called. Yeah. Um, so that's that's ready to come out. Uh, actually, before that, the next project is called Absinthe, okay. uh, and it's um, that's a that's coming out in December. I, I just finished the last edits uh, before proofreads uh, and sent that in yesterday. Um, so uh, it's good timing um, <laughs> for this interview. Uh, so that that that's a uh, it's my first foray into a novel length anyway, um, a more science fictional. Um, story. I've written some short stories that are science fictional, uh, but this is my first novel length project. Uh, and it's, um, it's billed as like a deco punk um, story. So think steampunk in the 1920s, you know, roaring 20s. It's a, it's a reimagined Chicago. Um, and it's a, 
um, it's kind of um, Inception, the movie Inception meets Metropolis uh, okay. by way of The Great Gatsby. Okay. Um, so, so very, I lean hard into the Art Deco, uh, Art Nouveau uh, movements, you know, which were popular at the time. Um, and it's a, so it's a story about Liam, uh, who is a World War I vet. Um, and he, um, he has amnesia from the war. He suffered a head wound at the end of the war, um, or so he thinks. Um, he starts to have memories come back to him, especially when he meets uh, the president of the United States, a, a fictional Leyland de Pere. Uh, and when he comes in contact with de Pere, he starts to realize that he was part of an experiment okay. during the war um, that changed him. Um, and so how it changed him um, and why the government is now after him is like the heart of the story. Um, and it starts to reveal some plans uh, that the president may have that Liam may want to stop um, before things get out of control. Uh, and so, yeah, so that one's um, all set coming out in December in the UK and the US. Um, and then the, uh, the Precipice trilogy is a, is back to fantasy again. Um, and I, I have, I've shied away from like Western European uh, motifs, you know, like uh, I just didn't want to tread that ground because I felt like I'd, it had been tread enough. Um, and I'm still not, I, I would say going fully into that um, but, I, but I am, I am touching on that kind of motif with dragons. It's, it's a very dragon centric story. Um, and it's also a lot about empire, um, and, and, and what that means to the, the people that are conquered, uh, when empire is, is created and the things that are, um, that are lost and forgotten along the way, buried, you know, in some ways by the arrival of, of some new empire. Um, and, and this notion of something should not be forgotten um, kind of rears its ugly head over the course of this trilogy. Um, and so this one features um, a, uh, a young thief uh, type character, kind of a Loch Lamora-ish kind of character named Rylan um, and a, an Imperial Inquisitor um, who, who sort of gets uh, wind of his thievery uh, along the way uh, named Lorelei. Um, and so R Rylan and Lorelai become the same, the, the main characters, and, and they are, um, uh, they, they oppose one another uh, in the beginning, but they get wrapped up in this larger story uh, along with their dragons. Um, and, and the dragons become a central thread um, in that they are, they're sort of the apex um, creatures in terms of like magic. Um, there, there are like a, 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 a bright sun and a dark sun in, in this world. Uh, and the bright sun gives certain powers and the dark sun gives opposing powers in a way. And so likewise, there are two types of dragons. Um, and so I'm, 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 I'm absolutely mining my old D and D experience where there were like <laughs> metallic dragons, like silver dragons, gold dragons, bronze dragons. Um, and there was like opposing dragons, blue dragons, black dragons, white dragons, um, and so they, so, um, yeah, so, so they come in, into play um, and sort of illuminate the different types of magic and Rylan and Lorelei are kind of aligned with two different dragons that are sort of opposed and stuff. And so that, that comes out of the story too. Okay. So that, that one's like a, like, I have like a quarter of the first book written um, and I'm really liking how it's, it's turning out so far. So I'm, I'm eager to, to get back into it. I like the, the, you know the the, the dark and uh, bright uh, sun. It's like super, yeah. Superman with yeah. the, the yellow and the red sun. Oh yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's, so that's great. Yeah, yeah, that'll that'll be that'll be fun. I um, I think that'll be neat. It's it's, it's a slightly different style. Like it's not fully. Yeah, you, you say um, last year you 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 tell me that it will be more traditional. Um, a bit. A bit, yeah. I, I, I almost want them to be like nearing the point of the industrial age. Um, you know, they're, it's kind of on the cusp of that. Uh, but so that's that's the empire, which is um, uh, which mostly lives in this ring of mountains, and in the center of that, it's this massive forest um, that is the source of a lot of a lot of this like dark magic. Um, and so they are a little bit more primitive, and so the, there's kind of a clash of cultures. Um, clash of technology levels in a way, um, you know, and, and the people from these, this forest adjust in different ways because of that. Um, and they have their own, their own history and culture that's slowly being eaten away, you know, by the empire too. And um, 
so yeah, it's it's going to be fun to play with that. I have one last question um, because we all know that you are the fantasy master, but you are also known as the kitchen master. <laughs> uh, and you know that I love banana bread, so I would like to ask you, uh, what is your special ingredient uh, of your banana bread? Ah, If you have well, one. yeah. So I mean, I, I can I can narrow it down to a single ingredient, and that is. Uh, so I use a, a recipe from um, Cooks Illustrated. Um, is is kind of a famous um, manual of cooking. It has a bunch of recipes, but it also has like a bunch of um, techniques and secrets. Um, it, it goes uh, similar to Alton Brown, if you're familiar with him. He goes into the science of cooking, so you understand why things do what they do when you're cooking them. Um, and so anyway, so for, for banana bread, um, the, the trick is you uh, microwave the bananas. Uh, and what that does is it pulls all the moisture out. Um, yeah. And so the, uh, the bananas themselves become drier And so you take those out and you mash them. Um, and then you take the, the liquid, which is quite watery, yeah. and then you, you put it in a pot and you reduce it um, to about, about a quarter. And so it becomes very syrupy. It's almost like a uh, like essence of banana, basically, or like a simple syrup. Um, and, so, and then you add that back to the, to the recipe. So you get lo like lots of intense banana flavor without it being like overly moist, um, you know, just the right amount of moist, moistness uh, in the end. So, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I will try this. <laughs> yeah. I also like, I will add one more. So I, I, I like, um, uh, well, nutmeg is great in that recipe, like uh, apple pie type spices, cinnamon, nutmeg, yeah. that sort of thing. But I really like ancho chili powder. Chili powder. Okay. So, uh, ancho specifically, A-N-C-H-O. Okay. Uh, ancho chilies are, are very light in spice. They're not very hot, uh, yeah. but they have like a, almost a raisiny type flavor uh, to them. Um, and it just adds a cool, uh, uh undertone yeah. to whatever you add it to. Okay. So that's, that's a fun one to add. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> so do you have anything you will, you will has, uh, you would like to add maybe? Oh gosh, no. Um, I guess, um, you know, if you, Fans out there, friends, uh, new readers, if you want to find out more about me, you can go to quillings.com. Uh, that's Q-U-I-L-L-I-N-G-S.com. Um, so I'm in there. I'm also on, on Twitter um, and Instagram, too. I, I post miscellaneous things, like cooking stuff mostly lately, uh, <laughs> but news about new projects as well. So you can kind of you know, keep an eye on things there. Perfect. Um, so that's the end of the interview. And... Uh, If you don't know the series, uh, you, uh, uh, my advice is to get your first book and read it because it's brilliant. It's epic fantasy. Um, as I say, uh, it's very emotional and the series, like you, very attached to the, the family. Uh, mm. And yeah, 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 I don't know the, the words, but... Uh, for me, it came from the heart, you know, and you, you read this, the, the, the series. Um, like you said with uh, Frodo and Sam, uh, it's like, it's, it is something comforting, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because we thought um, about your own family and all the characters are somehow related to a, a, a great view, a great point. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Beaulieu, for this series and to being here as well. Uh, it was an honor. Uh, we, we talked since maybe four years now and just on, on, social, on social. Yeah, media. yeah. But uh, it was a great honor to have you here uh, today. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for the kind words, and I'm glad uh, the story touched you so much i mean that's that's my that's any author's you know goal is to have it connect in some way so i'm i'm glad that it did with you and i hope that it does with others thank you et salut salut euh, ben écoutez j'espère que cette interview vous aura plu euh, voilà j'en suis tout de même assez content et fier je vais essayer de dire ça 
parce que bah, j'ai quand même bien merdé au niveau de l'anglais. Euh, on est toujours très difficile avec soi-même, certes, mais je sais que je parle mieux que ça. Mais euh, bon, voilà, le stress, le fait d'avoir aussi Bradley Pibolieu en, en face, parce que c'est quand même, bah, il est dans mon top 3 de mes auteurs euh, de, de tous les temps en fantasy. C'est pas rien, euh, c'est pas rien d'avoir quelqu'un que vous admirez énormément, parce que j'admire l'auteur, mais j'admire aussi euh, la personne qu'il est, donc euh, c'est pas rien d'avoir ce, ce, ce genre d'émotion, en tout cas, et de le vivre. Euh, je voulais vous remercier déjà d'avoir pu, euh, et d'avoir euh, réussi à écouter toute cette interview. Euh, je voulais vous remercier également, parce que du coup, vous avez été d'un bon soutien euh, tout au long de, de cette petite semaine où je stressais avant l'interview, en me disant que voilà, il fallait que j'en profite et il euh, fallait que je, je profite surtout de l'instant, et que oui, ça allait être stressant, mais que ça allait être que du bonheur, c'était le cas. Voilà. Et du coup, euh, dans les remerciements, je ne peux pas ne pas évoquer euh, ma Rachel, euh, sans qui je ne pense pas qu'on aurait eu les sous-titres à temps, parce que très clairement, c'était au-delà de mes compétences, j'aurais pu me former certes, mais vous auriez eu la vidéo, je crois, au mois de, <rire> de novembre ou décembre, ouais, très certainement pour Noël. Donc voilà, un grand merci à toi Rachel, parce que tu as fait vraiment un travail de fou, et je te remercie énormément. Euh, un grand merci également à deux personnes qui ont vu euh, mes questions. Euh, J'étais un petit peu stressé, euh, un petit peu de manque de confiance en soi, très certainement aussi. Je leur ai juste demandé de visualiser mes questions. Je voulais pas qu'ils en rajoutent, je voulais pas qu'ils les corrigent, mais juste de me dire si, euh, en tout cas pour eux, il y avait un bon fil conducteur, s'il y avait quelque chose de bien, enfin, si ça menait quelque chose de bien. Euh, donc, du coup, je voulais re remercier énormément ben, Emmanuel Chastelière, à qui j'avais envoyé euh, mes questions, euh, qui est donc chroniqueur, qui est, qui est créateur du site El Bakin, mais qui est aussi auteur et traducteur. Euh, donc, merci à toi, Emmanuel. Merci beaucoup, beaucoup. Ça m'a vraiment, euh, conforté et réconforté. Et puis euh, Lorraine de chez Léa Édition, euh, Lorraine Remarque, qui a eu la gentillesse aussi de bien vouloir accepter de voir mes questions et qui a su aussi me détendre tout au long euh, de mes euh, envois, de messages euh, stressés. Euh, voilà. Euh, donc merci beaucoup euh, à tous les deux. Voilà. Donc euh, je vous laisse, euh, je vais, enfin je ne vais pas vous garder plus longtemps. Je voulais juste remercier toutes ces personnes-là. Merci également à vous et à vous toutes et tous bah, de, 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 du soutien que vous m'avez donné. Et puis euh, bah, je vous souhaite une belle journée.